Disregarding the potential dangers posed by wild animals is a lesson learned when it's too late. While wolves can evoke a sense of majestic wilderness, these cunning predators, equipped with sharp teeth and a pack mentality, pose significant threats to both livestock and, in rare instances, even humans. Their relentless pursuit and formidable hunting skills have resulted in tragic encounters, serving as a stark reminder of the potentially deadly consequences of underestimating the dangers that wolves can pose in certain situations. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is horrific animal disasters. The wolf, a powerful and cunning beast, stands as a symbol of both awe-inspiring resilience and formidable danger. These majestic creatures, with their untamed spirit and primal prowess, remind us of the raw beauty and harsh realities of the wilderness. The danger that wolves can pose when their natural instincts clash with human civilization can be deadly. Wolves are highly intelligent and social carnivores known for their complex pack structures and remarkable hunting abilities. Wolves are known for their extensive vocalizations, including howls, barks, and growls. Howling is a significant form of communication used to announce territory, locate pack members, and coordinate during hunts. They're skilled hunters, often working together in coordinated efforts to bring down prey. Wolves have evolved specialized adaptations for survival, including sharp teeth and claws, keen senses of sight and smell, and powerful legs for efficient running. The piercing howls that echo through the wilderness carry with them a reminder of the unpredictable and sometimes harsh nature of the wild. Encounters with these creatures, while rare, demand a respect for the potential risks they present emphasizing the importance of coexistence with the untamed forces that share our world. For Kenton Joel Carnegie, his wolf encounter would be a nightmare. A geological engineering student hailing from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, Kenton Joel Carnegie, was actively engaged in a co-op program, gaining practical experience in mining operations. Assigned to Points North Landing, a mining camp situated about 750 kilometers north of Saskatoon, Carnegie was working for Sander Geophysics during his co-op term. The camp, located near Wollaston Lake in northern Saskatchewan, had already witnessed an unsettling encounter with aggressive wolves on November 4, 2005, just days after Carnegie's arrival. Two mining personnel had bravely fended off an attack by two wolves on the airfield and shared their ordeal with the camp during dinner. Regrettably, their warnings were seemingly dismissed by fellow workers. One local at the camp took the story more seriously, cautioning others about the potential threat and emphasizing the fortunate survival of the men involved in the earlier encounter. Wolf experts later categorized the November 4th incident as an exploratory attack. Four wolves in the Point's North Landing vicinity had been reported feeding on camp refuse, exhibiting behavior that indicated a lack of fear towards humans. A few days after his arrival, Carnegie, prompted by the accounts of wolf sightings in the area, informed his mother about the unnerving incidents, although he hadn't encountered a wolf himself. On November 8, 2005, a week into his stay, Carnegie sought permission to explore the geology of nearby Lake Wollaston alone. Despite concerns about safety due to heavy snowfall and overcast foggy conditions, he was granted permission to venture out setting a return time of 7 p.m. As Carnegie reached the lake, he immersed himself in the untouched wilderness, but a shift in the atmosphere caught his attention as twilight deepened. Sensing an eerie silence and a chill down his spine, he decided it was time to return to camp. Unbeknownst to him, a group of wolves had been tracking his footsteps through the snow, showcasing an unsettling level of intelligence. Joel, feeling the hairs on the back of his neck stand, noticed a lone wolf a few meters away. Quickening his pace, he soon realized two more wolves were stalking him from the side, with the first wolf tracking him from behind. Panic set in as the wolves closed in, their eyes glowing in the dark. In a heart-stopping moment, the pack lunged at Joel, surrounding him with primal fury. Despite his desperate attempts to fend them off, the relentless wolves pushed him to the brink of survival. Around 8 p.m., the camp personnel became aware that Kenton had not returned as scheduled, missing dinner. Mark Eichel, the camp owner, initiated a search with geophysicist Chris Van Galder and bush pilot Todd Svarkop. 
They scoured Kenton's quarters and the entire camp, finding no trace. Noticing Kenton's tracks leading away from camp in the fresh snow, the group drove in a truck, exploring the nearby lake. As they neared the serene waters, an unsettling atmosphere descended upon them upon discovering disturbed earth and wolf paw prints. Kenton's tracks led toward the lake shore. Upon spotting the tracks, the search party returned to the camp for a rifle, a more powerful flashlight, and a radio. The party then ventured to a nearby cabin, suspecting Kenton might be there, but found no evidence of his footprints. Soon after, they identified Kenton's footprints diverging from the main road towards a trail leading to the lake, accompanied by wolf tracks. Mark Eichel, shining his flashlight in the direction of the footprints, discovered what he believed to be Kenton's lifeless body. He instructed everyone to return to the truck to shield others from the distressing sight. During their journey back to camp, Mark Eichel radioed Robert Dennis Berseth, a camp employee, longtime North resident and seasoned hunter. Berseth recognized the gravity of the situation, contacted his wife, the local coroner at Wollaston Lake, and urged her to notify the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. At approximately 7.30 p.m., Eichel and Berseth returned to the scene by truck. Although Eichel suspected Kenton's demise, he sought confirmation and a second opinion. Parking the truck, they walked down the ridge along the lake's edge, encountering numerous wolf tracks. Illuminating the area with a flashlight, Eichel and Berseth observed Kenton's body, with exposed flesh and ribs visible from the belt up. Keeping their visit brief, they returned to camp to await the arrival of the police and coroner, who reached the site around 9.35 p.m. Neither Bob Berseth nor Mark Eichel approached the body until they accompanied the RCMP constable and the coroner. Kenton's body had been relocated from its previous position, as seen by Mark Eichel and Bob Berseth two hours earlier, with a shift of approximately 20 yards. During this interval, a significant portion of the body had been consumed. The constable and the coroner commenced securing and inspecting the site, while Berseth and Mark Eichel surveyed the area with a rifle. As the constable approached Kenton's body, he spotted two wolves in close proximity and discharged two rounds from his shotgun into the air to deter them from the body. Rosalie Sani, a coroner at the scene, recalled the unnerving experience, stating, We were cleaning up and taking care of the young man when we started to hear them howl, and it was just too close for comfort for me. It felt as if I would reach over and touch the one to my left. It just seemed like he was close and I could hear the rest, and it sounded like four or five of them, like calling to each other. The constable observed numerous wolf tracks on the land and on the snow of the frozen lake. Eichel received instructions from the constable to discharge his rifle periodically into the air as the wolves were audible in the nearby bushes. They meticulously examined and photographed the body and its surroundings for 45 minutes before placing Carnegie's mangled remains into a body bag. Investigators managed to reconstruct the sequence of events leading to Carnegie's fate Initially walking from the camp, a wolf had started following his tracks by the time he covered a kilometer, essentially blocking his return to the camp. One wolf trailed him from the forest while another stalked him from the lake. Kenton, situated on the shoreline, spotted the approaching wolf. The boot prints in the snow revealed that Carnegie accelerated his pace as two additional wolves closed in from the sides. Given the clear line of sight, he was within sight of the camp, potentially attempting to attract someone's attention. More wolf tracks converged where Kenton stood, suggesting the involvement of more than two wolves, as several approached from the south and one approached from the north. Seeking escape, Kenton's footprints turned back towards the road leading to the camp. The first evident struggle occurred 2.2 meters or 7 feet from the initiation of the chase, marked by disturbed snow indicative of an altercation resembling someone rolling in the snow. Four additional scuffle sites were identified, leading to the location where his body was eventually discovered. Kenton was repeatedly knocked down, and the wolves drew blood, yet he resiliently kept getting back up. Ultimately, the animals overpowered him, preventing him from regaining his footing. Rosalie Sani, the province's northern coroner who was present at the scene and facilitated Carnegie's body removal, emphasized the presence of additional wolves on the way. One or two more wolves approached from the side, complimenting the first wolf, tracking him from behind. Zani remarked, I believe he saw this wolf behind him. 
That's when he thought he would have been in trouble and started running. And just shortly after that, about seven feet from there or less, the first scuffle happened. And there were about five scuffles that led to the point where the men had discovered his body. It is believed that Carnegie fought valiantly before succumbing to the wolves. Three days following Carnegie's demise, wildlife officers from the Environment Department shot two wolves. A necropsy conducted at the University of Saskatchewan unveiled bits of hair and other materials in the digestive tract of at least one of the wolves. The undigested material was deemed potentially linked to the predation on a human being. Described as black and white, robust, well-muscled and weighing 46 kilograms, one of the wolves exhibited no signs of rabies and was declared perfectly healthy. Despite its health, it was implicated in the potential killing of a human being. Following Carnegie's death, a protective electric fence was erected around the landfill at Point's North Landing to prevent future encounters with predatory animals. A decade later, a lone timber wolf assaulted a 26-year-old male worker during his midnight break near the main camp. A vigilant security guard intervened, scaring the wolf away. Subsequent to this incident, authorities mandated the tracking and shooting of wolves in the vicinity. Furthermore, they enforced inspections of the food disposal systems and the perimeter fence surrounding the landfill. Additionally, heightened educational efforts were implemented for the mining staff members. Kenton Joel Carnegie, as described by friends and family, was a free spirit with a passion for music and an affinity for art, all while pursuing his dream of becoming an engineer. According to his father, Carnegie was a multitasker with diverse interests, enjoying engagement in various projects to keep himself occupied. In an interview, his father said he was the kind of kid that, when he sat down at the TV, he would be flicking the channels all the time and doing a puzzle at the same time. He was just a dynamic kid. While wolves possess an undeniable allure in the wilderness, romanticizing these creatures blinds us to the harsh realities of their dangers. With their primal instincts and pack mentality, wolves can swiftly transition from majestic symbols to formidable threats. Their sharp teeth and relentless hunting skills make them capable predators. Encountering a wolf in the wild is a rare occurrence and these animals generally avoid humans. However, it's essential to be prepared and know how to respond in the unlikely event of a wolf encounter. Keep your composure and try to remain as calm as possible. Avoid panicking as sudden movements or loud noises may escalate the situation. Running may trigger a wolf's predatory instincts. Wolves are skilled runners and can easily outrun humans. Stand your ground and maintain a non-threatening posture. Wolves often see direct eye contact as a sign of dominance. Hold your gaze without staring aggressively and slowly back away without turning your back on the wolf. Raise your arms and stand on your tiptoes to make yourself appear larger. Open your jacket if you are wearing one. This can make you seem more intimidating to the wolf. Yell, clap your hands, or make loud noises to deter the wolf. Use a firm and assertive voice to show dominance. If you have a jacket or any other item, use it to shield yourself. In some cases, carrying a stick or a trekking pole may provide a visual deterrent and a means to defend yourself if necessary. If a wolf lunges, protect your neck and throat. Use your arms to shield your face and neck while keeping your vital areas as covered as possible. Consider carrying bear spray, which can also be effective against wolves. If you have it, use it. Understanding and respecting their behavior is key to minimizing the risk of an encounter. Vital tip so you can make it through a horrific animal disaster.